Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Laura Kelly, and today I'll be talking about rapidly iterating across platforms using server-driven UI. Um, so a bit about me. I'm an Android engineer at Airbnb, and I previously worked on front-end web. Um, I work on the Trip Platform team, which is the team responsible for building things like um, reservation screens and the itinerary where you see your trip. And in my spare time, I'm a powerlifter and a whiskey connoisseur. So today I'll be talking about the problem we were trying to solve and why server-driven UI fit the bill. I'll deep dive into our Android implementation, and then I'll show some case studies from how we've been using server-driven systems elsewhere at Airbnb. So Airbnb started as a homes business for, where people can book a place to stay when they're traveling on vacation. We have a screen that looks kind of like this to show you the details of your reservation. So things like directions, how to contact the host, that type of information. In 2016, Airbnb launched a product that really changed how we think about a trip. We launched something called Experiences. An experience is an activity hosted by a local expert that you can book when you're traveling to a new place. Um, so when we built out Experiences, we built out a reservation screen for that as well. And as you can see, it looks pretty similar to the home reservation screen with a couple tweaks. Now, when we started doing experiences, we started thinking about Airbnb as a platform for your end-to-end -end trip. And so we've been launching more and more products to, to help uh, so that you can book anything that you need for your trip on our platform. So for instance, now you can book a reservation, or you can book a restaurant reservation on Airbnb, and you can also book a co-working space. So as we launch these different products, we would build out a new screen for each of these reservations. And you can see they all look kind of similar, but there's a few things here and there that change. So we were thinking about this after a couple of these new launches, and we thought we were rebuilding the same screen uh, over and over again, multiplying our efforts across the code base. And because Airbnb is a mobile forward company where we want to launch on all platforms, web, iOS, and Android, we were also duplicating our efforts across platforms. So the engineers on my team and I got together and we thought, there's got to be a better way than building out a new screen each time we want to build something really similar for one of these new uh, reservations. So we thought about what would an ideal system entail? We wanted something that would be easy to understand. So the way that these launches work is we usually have the team that's launching the product come work with us for a few weeks to build that new reservation screen. And so we have a lot of people coming in and out of our code base who need to get familiarized with it and efficiently build something new really quickly. We all know that designers like to paint outside the lines. So we wanted to make a system that would be flexible. We wanted something where we would have um, a system of like recommended components for what a reservation should look like, but we knew that inevitably when someone wanted to, to uh, innovate within the bounds of design that we could support that. So we wanted something really extensible. We wanted to be able to launch without a Play Store release. When, uh, when we're trying to launch these things across platforms, it can really be a problem if, uh, if some feature misses branch cut or um, it's, it's hard because we don't have the exact same schedule. Um, we might not have the features out and the exact same schedule. So we wanted something where we could launch something new but, have to, but avoid that Play Store release. And finally, uh, we wanted to minimize repetition as well. We wanted to get rid of all that boilerplate of making a new screen every time we wanted to launch something really similar. And finally, we wanted something that was easy to maintain. So with these screens, something that would happen sometimes is we would fix a bug on, say, the home reservation screen. But then it was still popping up on the experiences screen. So we wanted something where if we fixed a bug once, it would be fixed everywhere. So the system that we settled on is something that we call server-driven UI. Let's take a look at what that looks like. Server-driven UI is a system in which your API response dictates which components are rendered on the screen. So breaking that down, this is what the API response looks like for a reservation. And you can see here that in this response, there's an array that has different types indicated for each uh, component that's being sent up to the client. So we take this API response, send it to the client, and then on the client, we parse that into data models. So I'll go into this a little more in depth on Android, but for now, this is the high level. So you can see we take that carousel row type and we map it to a carousel data model. Very similarly in our front end web code, we have a mapping that's pretty much the same thing. 
So once the client maps that into these polymorphic data models, the rendering layer on the client will then take those data models and parse them into actual rendered components. So on a high level, how it works on Android, iOS, and web is we send this API response with a list of components. They get mapped to data models, and then they're rendered into uh, components. So suppose we change our mind on the screen. Suppose that we want to put a map in that first component instead of that photo. Well, all we do is make a simple backend change, and then that map row will now be showing up on iOS, Android, and web just by that one change on the back end. And similarly, we can change the ordering of things as well. So it's really easy to make changes and have them propagate to everything. So we built out this system and reflected on what some of the benefits were. And here's what we came up with. Um, build once. So we wanted to minimize repetition, but we noticed there were even more benefits to this than we thought. For example, we have a lot of performance improvements, such as offline caching built into the screen. We also have logging, and um, we also have accessibility built into some of these, some of these uh, components and screens. So whereas before, uh, when we had a new team come and build a new screen, they would have to build out those, uh, that SQL code to, to offline cache their screen, it's baked into this system, so they don't even have to worry about that. And we also have really accessible screens uh, without developers having to think too much about it. It easily accommodates changing minds. So this was a big one that we thought about we, how we wanted it to work in the beginning, and we got some even bigger benefits. So if we decided to like reskin these components or theme them, it would be pretty easy to do so. Um, another thing we discovered is that this works really well with our existing component library. So at Airbnb, we have a system called the design language system. It's a design spec for um, components that are supported across platforms. And we already had an existing component library um, for this DLS spec. So we could just plug this system right into those components that already existed and save a lot of time with that code. It works really well with server-driven UI. And finally, this is something we wanted, but we really, really appreciated it once we built it out. We can iterate, reconfigure, and experiment in our own time. We're really big on changing things up and trying new things at Airbnb, so this was huge for us. Okay, so that's how it works um, on a high level on all platforms. Let's take a look at how it works exactly in Android. So the first step in this is a JSON blob is sent up to the client. And then the client will parse that network response into an array of rows. And this is kind of like the base class of rows. So those rows get parsed into polymorphic subtypes. Um, you can see here there's a link row, there's a map row, there's a title row. And then we take those polymorphic data models and pass them to our fragment, um, where they're configured in our UI controller. And one thing to note here is that we're just using one fragment for each of these different types of screens, which is nice because we skip the boilerplate of having to write um, a lot of that setup code. And then finally, uh, once we send those data models up to the controller, they're um, turned into rendered UI components. So let's take a look in the code at this particular step, parsing the network response. So we're using Jack, a library called Jackson to deserialize our JSON right now, and we're also using auto value. But really the relevant part of this is that there's only really one important property here, and that's the rows data model, or the array list of row data models. This is where all of the components are stored in this data model. So now uh, we have that class. We need to add those, we need to parse those subtypes. So again, what that looks like in the code is we have some Jackson here. So there's um, this Jackson annotation that's declaring a new subtype of this base row data class. And then this annotation has a property called name. This corresponds to the name that we sent up in that JSON blob indicating what type of component this is. And then we map that to a value, which is just a, another data model class that is a subtype of this row model class. And that row, uh, that link row data model subclass looks something like this. The relevant part is that it's implementing the, the base class, the row data model. And it has whatever properties are needed for this given component to render. So for a link row, we have an app URL, which is a deep link. We have a couple IDs, and we have a title. So now those data models get parsed into subtypes, and we pass them to our reservation controller. 
So I won't go into this too much, but um, we're using for our UI controllers uh, a library called Epoxy, which is a library we have open sourced at Airbnb. Um, it's for building complex screens in a recycler view, and it has a really nice declarative syntax. The declarative syntax makes it really easy for us to support a lot of different types of components in this controller, but um, configure them and turn them on depending on what that API response looks like. So what it looks like in our controller is we have this big when statement that will take, uh, that will take a base row data model and it will parse into what subtype it is and call a build model Kotlin extension. So an extension might look something like this. Um, it's it's uh, creating a new component called basic row in this case, and it's passing in the title and setting an on-click listener. And then uh, once we've done that, once we've added those models to our epoxy controller, we just render those components, and it's super easy. So that's how we take this response and turn it into this UI on an Android device. So we started talking to a lot of other teams at Airbnb after we built out the system. And many of the other product teams were having similar issues we were. They wanted to iterate quickly, they wanted to be mobile forward launching on all platforms, and they often had changing product specs. So we, we learned that there were some other teams at Airbnb who had uh, used this concept in different and interesting ways. So one example of that is uh, Wally. So Wally is a service for um, user flows. And what I mean by a user flow is a multi-page um, multi set of forms. So you might be thinking, building forms is simple, right? Has anyone ever listed their place on Airbnb? It's actually pretty complicated. Um, we have a lot of complicated user flows, and that's because, um, in particular with the listing flow as an example, um, we have a lot of data we need to collect because we want to make sure that uh, the listing is accurate or, and we want to make sure it conforms to certain safety and legal standards, and we also want to allow the host to show off the unique properties of their listing. So it ends up being a really complicated flow in order to accommodate that. I'll give you an example. So we used to have this page on our list listing flow, and it's asking what type of place are you listing? So the first question is, uh, the, answer, the possible answers here are entire place, private room, or shared room. So let's suppose that we enter entire place here. The second question asks what type of property the, the owner is listing. So that could be an apartment, a house, a bed and breakfast, a loft, a cabin. If we enter in bed and breakfast for the second step, Airbnb actually defines a bed and breakfast as a place that only has private rooms. So that first question will then go back to defaulting to private room. Um, so just on this one simple screen with two questions, there's actually a lot of complexity with validation of answers and two answers depending on the other. Um, and so there, there are many, many examples like this of complex user interactions where we're doing a lot of validation logic um, in the Airbnb app. Previously, this was dealt with with a lot of client-side logic. And when you multiply that across three platforms, that's a lot to keep track of. So maybe the ordering was different on iOS compared to Android, and once you fix that, you notice that there's an, another issue with consistency on, uh, com say, compared to web. And also, whenever you want to update the ordering of steps or the ordering of questions or something about the validation logic, you have to wait for that release in the, in the Play Store, which makes it really hard to keep everything in sync at the same time. So the people who built Wally on the host success team thought about how could they offload some of that to the server so that they could have more up-to-date uh, like, um, up steps and validation that wouldn't be so tied to the client. So a Wally JSON payload looks something like this. Very similarly to reservations, it has a list of components that are going to be rendered. In addition to that list of components, there's also an ordered list of screens, and that includes conditions for validation. Those conditions for validation are using a generalized Wally schema that each client is implementing in the exact same way, um, but it's a generalized way of doing it, so it's, it's easier to specify. It's not super tied to uh, exactly one screen. So, there's an ordered list of screens that come in this payload, and there's also a list of questions for each, each of those screens, which also include conditions for validation in that schema. 
And finally, it comes with a list of answers, which could be uh, pre-populated answers, or it could be an answer that a user has previously given, or it could be empty if the user is going through this for the first time. So once that payload gets sent up to the client, um, the client knows how to parse those, those uh, validation condition schemas. And so essentially what happens is that questions are hidden and shown based on state. And also steps are hidden and shown based on state. So for example here, um, in the first question, how is, um, how is your stay at this place? Uh, if a user rates this a four star or a five star place, we'll show the screen that says, was there anything special to hosted? Um, and that's based on that uh, Wally JSON validation from screen to screen. So we hide or show things based on that state uh, with the Wally system, and it makes it much simpler because now all the clients are getting this information about the ordering of steps from the server side, so it's easier to keep things up to date, and we don't have to be reliant on releasing once a week in order to update these things or change the ordering. So another example at Airbnb is something called Lona. Um, our our front-end infra team noticed that a lot of teams at Airbnb were building out um, these server-driven systems. In fact, there were over 10 of them that product teams had built out for different purposes. And so they thought, is there any way we can make a more generalized way of doing this so people don't have to reinvent the wheel every time they want to use a server-driven system? They came up with something they're calling Lona Dynamic UI. So Lona is a unified format for describing views. Um, rather than tying it to one specific set of components for one specific type of feature, uh, it's supposed to cover our entire, uh, it's supposed to cover any type of view you would want. And it's pretty extensible to the rest of, to anything that you would want to build. Um, it, has the, it has the capability to render pages um, and natively parse things. So teams now won't have to build out their own, uh, their own system for rendering a page. And it can also underlie existing server-driven systems. So if Wally or Reservations decided to switch to this format, it could underlie those systems without having to switch to that rendering system. So it works with what we've already built out as well as uh, extending it. So if you're thinking that this might be a good fit for your, your app, here's some things to think about. First of all, the API, uh, the API design is really key. It's important to get this right. So spend a lot of time and talk, talk with your client engineers across platforms about how you should design this API. Um, it's important to think about how you might want to extend it or how the particular purpose you're using it for might change in the future and build for that. Think about your platform differences early on. Um, it's important to think about both visually and in terms of the APIs that are available um, on each platform, how you want to accommodate differences. So one example is uh, when we want to link to a different screen, we send down a deep link for our native clients, and we send down a URL for web clients. So think about things like that. Another example is uh, sometimes on web, we want to display a modal rather than a new screen. So that was something we, that was kind of tricky. Um, and know how server-driven you want to go. So you've seen kind of the full spectrum here. You could build out a server-driven system for one specific page that's really tightly defined, like reservations. Or you can try and cover the full gamut of uh, use cases, something like Lona. So there are pros and cons to doing those. So for the simpler use case, it's easier to build out, and it's easier to get the API right. But then you're limited to that one system that, for that one screen. With Lona, you can cover more use cases, but it's trickier because you need to handle a lot more things. So think about how server-driven you want to go. And so that's the story of how we are, we're using server-driven UI at Airbnb to rapidly iterate across platforms. Thanks. So we have time for questions. Uh, hey, could you? T I'm down here in the front. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about how you handle the logic with Wally and have the same logic uh, across different platforms for user flows? Um, like, is there a is there a particular part of it that like the questions or the screen to screen stuff? 
Yeah, kind of both, like how you manage to handle hiding steps based on what state you're in, and how do you apply that logic across platforms? So I think that the way it works is that um, they have a schema for how they are, they have a schema for the different types of like logic operations that could be supported. Like um, an example of the questions is like maybe it's a multiple choice question or maybe like you're supposed to enter in a number in a certain range. So they kind of like support a variety of like validation conditions. And then once they have that spec for how it's supposed to be handled, each client will then like implement for that spec like exactly how it will parse the Wally format of that question. And so um, there's generalized logic for validating built in on the clients, but the actual steps and questions that need to be validated are being sent up from the server. So it's offloading kind of like half of that validation to the server. Cool. Okay. And um, I would yeah. like to give the others a chance. So two more questions here, and then basically we need to wrap up. But I think you're available for individual questions afterwards, right? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the great presentation. I'm, my name is Harsh and I'm from Kuala Lumpur. My question is, uh, why didn't you choose to go with Flutter or React Native, something that can also be like server-driven? So we, we had these screens implemented previously in React Native. Um, that was actually the original implementation of some of these. Um, so the reason why it didn't work particularly well for this set of screens is that we have a hybrid app, meaning a lot of our code base is in native. And in particular with the reservation screen, um, there's a lot of jumping in between native and React Native, and especially trying to onboard other teams to that. Um, it was kind of difficult. It was difficult, and there was a lot of bridge code to write that made it difficult for this particular, for the reservation screen. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, I was just trying to um, ask you if there are more information of, um, about the systems you've uh, introduced here, like uh, about this Wally uh, and Lona. So, so are there any other sources, basically? Sure. So um, Lona is kind of like an in-progress thing. They've, been, they've just started working on it. So I think that you'll probably hear more updates about it. Um, but Lona is um, it's kind of like an in-progress thing. But the idea is that we want to make it so that anyone who wants to use this type of like um, system doesn't have to build out their own parsing. It, it will be built into this tool. Thanks. Thank you very much. Could I just have S one more? <laughs> one more? Oh, Thank well, you. OK. Is that OK? <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, Last I'm one before the lunch. I love the way it works, but how do you handle uh, backwards compatibility if a client would perhaps not know about a new sort of uh, raw data model? Yeah, I think that's one of the toughest things about building out a system like this. Um, I think for, for the more constrained use, use cases like reservations, it's easier because we can kind of predict like what different use cases we might want. Um, on the back end, it's mapped on versioning. So we know like uh, the new client, like if we release a new component that's supported, we know that the clients, uh, the native clients are like supported via like a specific app version. I would say one of, the, one of the trickiest ones to handle is nullability. So we had one component where none of the properties were nullable. And so when we, really, we needed like to make one of those properties nullable, and what we ended up having to do was just making a, a second component, which is kind of annoying, but uh, you know, it works. Yeah. OK, thank you. Go for it. Uh, just a quick question. Um, since you guys adopted this server-driven approach, uh, how many App Store releases have you had since then adopting that approach? Oh, I couldn't say. We've been working on this for like over a year, um, so quite quite a few. Yeah. Okay. Could we have any similar uh, problems ourselves? And uh, have you have you experienced uh, significant uh, improvements when adopting this approach? Uh, yeah, I think that we've seen significant improvements with um, with like launching new things and being able to iterate quickly. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. 